Hi, everyone. I don't know about you, but I found these discussions fascinating. I'm Ben Schifrin, Director of Securities Policy at Better Markets. We have reached our final panel of the conference. It's now time to look forward and consider what reforms are needed to end Too Big to Fail. We are lucky to have Louise Story as our moderator for this panel. Louise has done almost everything anyone can do in the news business. She is a veteran of the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and National Public Radio. She has worked on groundbreaking projects as an investigative reporter that led to multiple billion dollar financial settlements, government reforms, and legal convictions. She was also one of the superstar reporters during the financial crisis, and her byline was on the front page day after day. She is currently an author, consultant, and lecturer at the Yale School of Management. She has recently completed work on a book about the Black-White Wealth Gap, co-written with journalist Ebony Reed. It's due out in early 2024, and I can't wait to read it. Louise, we're thrilled to have you leading this panel. Over to you. Glad to be here, and thanks for such an insightful day. Um, I think this is going to be a very smart panel. We'll get right into it. I first want to give brief introductions of the four excellent speakers we have here, and please check out the website for a lot more bio information as well as many books that they have written. I'll introduce them in the order that we're going to go with their presentations. First, we have Reed Hunt. He's the co-founder, chairman, and CEO of the Coalition for Green Capital. He was the chairman of the FCC in the 1990s. He's done a lot of things in private equity and venture capital and written numerous books. The one that is very relevant for today um, is from 2019. It's called A Crisis Wasted, Barack Obama's Defining Decisions. Uh, we'll then hear from uh, Thomas Honig, and he's the former president of the Kansas City Federal Reserve. He is the former chair of the FDIC during many of these central important years uh, that we're talking about here. And he's a distinguished senior fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Then we'll hear from Gerald Epstein. He's a professor of economics and the founding co-director of the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and he has a forthcoming book called Busting the Bankers Club. Finally, we'll hear from Anat Admadi, and she is a professor of finance and economics at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, and she's written many things, um, especially relevant today is the Bankers New Clothes. So with that, we'll turn it over to Reed, and we look forward to your questions afterwards. Please post them. We'll be watching for them, and take away, Reed. Thank you, Louise. Uh, this is the book that Louise was talking about. Uh, uh, authors should really never talk about their books. The books should speak for themselves. But I was invited to talk about the book, so I'll violate that rule. In uh, I was on the Obama transition team in 2008 and nine, and um, so I knew all the, I knew all the, I met I knew or already knew and or or met the people that were crucial to the decision making in that winter of 2008 and 9 and after they'd made the decisions uh in 2010 and 11 I interviewed about four dozen of them uh the, those interviews are uh at the University of California of San Diego for anyone that wants to do the research uh, uh but I couldn't figure out uh, what to write in the book because I couldn't figure out the denouement. And I kept waiting for the plot to unfold year after year. And as the recovery uh, uh, was so incredibly slow and drawn out, and then there was the question of whether the, uh, President Obama would even be reelected at this point in time, a year in advance of the election, uh, a very significant percentage of the country didn't even want him to run again. A, a fact that's being repeated in history right now. So I just couldn't figure out the end. And then the end was that uh, Donald Trump uh, got elected. That was the end of a lot of hopes. That was the end of my hope that my uh, classmate from Yale Law School uh, would get to be the first woman president. 
uh, but it was also the end of um, a hope that the uh, what what I think we, we could call the neoliberal approach of 2008 and 9 actually would receive uh, popular uh, support. Uh, the answer is uh, that it didn't, and that um, whatever you call Trumpism and put aside all of the fraud and the chicanery and the deceit, put that all aside, the desire to have everything be different was clearly expressed in the in the vote for him and the vote against uh, Hillary. Uh, so so then I was able to write the book with this disappointing end. Uh, and I will now just uh, spare you having to read it by telling you four of the conclusions. <clears throat> uh, first, TARP, the bailout, uh, should have been passed the day before the Lehman bankruptcy and not uh, just a couple of weeks after. Uh, that was not impossible. In the summer of 2008, Barney Frank in Congress met with Hank Paulson. Uh, we don't know exactly what was said, but uh, but we have a pretty good idea about it from their different accounts. Uh, Barney said, uh, what's really on your mind? And the Treasury Secretary said uh, that he'd been told a couple of months earlier that uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were, were insolvent. They were going to go bankrupt. And uh, Barney said, what are we going to do about it? And Paulson said, well, if that happens, it's a disaster for the economy. It could cause a financial crisis. And the two of them agreed uh, right away to pass a law called HERA, H-E-R-A, well, which gave the government the ability to seize them and take them under government control, which is what happened. That was the exact moment when Hank Paulson decided not uh, to apply the same remedy to anyone else in the financial uh, system, even though he knew that Lehman Brothers uh, had a very good chance of going bankrupt. He knew that every day from the summer all the way to uh, September. Uh, and by Labor Day, two weeks before the anniversary that we're uh, marking here today, uh, it was absolutely crystal clear. Um, and his his policy decision was that the government should not intervene. And then when it went bankrupt, the government uh, had to intervene because it was immediately realized that the consequences were far, far more devastating uh, than than had been imagined. Henry James says the key uh, to life is an imagination of disaster. That's not what was the case at that particular time. So we know now that if the government is going to have to act better that it has the authority to do so before the crisis, as opposed to scrambling afterwards. Uh, number two, fairness matters. Uh, in TARP, the government should have insisted on warrants in the, in the banks that were certain to go back up in terms of their market cap or it could have insisted on a uh, refunding of the um, of the TARP money uh, in, in a big way, such as by a transaction tax on, on financial transactions. These are the things that Henry Waxman asked for. Uh, he was told by Paulson, we don't have time to, to have fairness in this bill. We just need the bailout. Uh, that was a mistake. The, uh, the popular reaction to that uh, stretched out over time and does, in fact, lead uh, uh, to Trumpism. Uh, the third rule, the stimulus bill, ARRA, it should have been uh, twice as large as it was. Uh, actually, that was known uh, approximately two days after it was announced, uh, meaning in early January, when the economic results from December uh, were reported uh, by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, it was crystal clear that the stimulus was undersized. And the administration decided to do nothing about that uh, Paul Krugman, who, uh, in my experience, is either uh, paid attention to or not on a 50-50 basis by people in the government, on that particular occasion, he published in the New York Times uh, the following. The stimulus is about half the size that it needs to be for the recovery. The administration's decision was it was better to hurry up and get Congress to endorse a stimulus that was too small rather than to redefine the scale of the problem and run the risk that uh, everybody would become frightened. Everyone became frightened anyhow, and it would have been better to have the stimulus be uh, twice as big. Uh, and then lastly, uh, the macro thinking. Uh, the Rogoffs came out with a book at that time that said that the proportion of, of public debt to the GDP was a critical ratio uh, that absolutely defined the limits of uh, debt that the government could take on. Uh, it was later pointed out that some of their math was wrong, but the larger policy point is that 
that ratio has nothing to do with the actual capability of the government to act. Uh, because what matters for the government's action is trust in the in the currency and in the in the ability of the country uh, uh, to fund its debt. So those are the four lessons, and we know uh, that they are probably right because we had a rerun of the Lehman crisis when COVID took the place of a bank failure, and those four lessons were applied by the uh, Democratic Congress in working with President Trump in 2020, and then applied big time with by the Democratic Congress working with President Biden in uh, 2021. Uh, uh, by applying these lessons, let's have the stimulus be really, really big. Uh, let's have it be uh, that uh, it, it covers many, many issues. Uh, let's not uh, be uh, hampered by hypothetical concerns about the uh, debt to GDP ratio. These lessons were applied not because the Biden people read my book. Uh, I interviewed them, many of them for the book. Uh, uh, they might have known of the title at least, but the real reason they applied these lessons is that they learned from their own experience. They came into the post-COVID crisis with a vivid sense of their own um, inability to have delivered a rapid recovery before, and they weren't going to uh, repeat that. Uh, uh, when the Biden people announced their uh, economic policy, Larry Summers said that it was the worst economic policy in history. Um, so far, there's little evidence to support that um, statement. But what is true is that the Biden plan was pretty close to the opposite of the plan that Larry Summers, uh, as the head of the National Economic Council, uh, strongly and, and successfully urged on President Obama. Well, I haven't written the uh, book about a crisis not wasted, uh, which is the, uh, the Biden uh, uh, solution, but I thought that I would go ahead and give you uh, the six lessons by way of conclusion. <clears throat> First, it's very, very important for an administration to be bold in its first dealings with Congress. The Obama administration decided that whatever they asked Congress to do, uh, it had to, they had to be completely successful, and they sequenced every event. So the sequence that they chose was first the stimulus, then the health care package, and then the environmental package. The Biden people decided it's more important to ask Congress to do everything all at once in parallel, fill every committee with an agenda, and be prepared to ask for twice as much as you'd be happy to get. Uh, the reason I know that that's the case is that that's what the Chief of Staff Ron Klain told me would be the plan at the beginning of 2020, when he didn't know he would be the Chief of Staff, but he did tell me that that was, that was the plan, and that's what they did. Uh, lesson number two is that the government can mobilize additional private capital by uh, engaging in stimulus and produce a tremendous amount of public-private investment. Uh, lesson three is that if you uh, turn the economy off, as we did in COVID, the service sector will turn back on very, very quickly, but the manufacturing sector won't, so you will have shortages and you will have inflation in produced goods, and it won't last uh, all that long. Fourth, uh, because the United States does stand behind its debt obligations, and because it is an open economy, uh, we can attract capital from anywhere in the world uh, when we need it. Uh, fifth, uh, the political party that wants to do the most for the most people has the upper hand. If you narrow your focus to just uh, restoring the banking sector, you're going to lose political capital. Uh, and lastly, uh, it is necessary for the United States to gain uh, the trust of of all the world and of its own uh, uh, society uh, that it's going to be able to pay its bills. And what that means is that the United States has to have an appropriate effective tax rate for the wealthy, uh, which we do not have. Thank you. We'll turn it over to Tom now. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Louise. And I want to thank Better Markets for the opportunity to address this group. And, and I am going to talk about Too Big to Fail. Um, I think the first thing I would tell you is too big to fail is more entrenched in our economy today than it ever has been. Um, the firms are now larger, they're more complex, and they're more powerful than, today than they were in 2008 and 9, uh, and that's going to continue. 
Uh, Dodd-Frank did not end too big to fail. It did have lots of regulation. Uh, it did raise the cost uh, in terms of uh, bank regulatory cost, and it did increase barriers to entry. It also did some regulatory reforms that were necessary, but it did not solve too big to fail. We need to acknowledge that. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to say some things that uh, have been said earlier, and that is capital, equity capital, I think is the key to mitigating, not eliminating, but mitigating the effects of too big to fail. And we need to focus on that going forward. And in recent days, I, the too big to fail banks have made their voice heard regarding recent capital proposals. And so I want to discuss the topic of capital and its importance. And I want to emphasize the advantage of judging capital using the leverage ratio, not the Basel capital standards uh, that are out there. And I would start by saying, regarding that, I would start by saying that the Basel capital program is not a rule to be followed. It is a game to be played. And the two big to fail banks are masters of the game. I start uh, also by saying too big to fail banks would have you believe they are burdened with too much of their own money funding their activities because capital is, after all, uh, investor money, not borrowed funds, and it is uh, the most stable source a bank can have. So with that, model capital game allows the too big to fail banks to shrink their balance sheet and thereby increase the perception of how much capital they have when it's not there. And Basel distorts the allocation of capital within the economy because it puts arbitrary risk on assets and therefore directs capital to flow according to what the regulators think, not what the market thinks. And the market does in the longer run uh, get it more right more often than the regulators do. That's not an uh, overwhelming endorsement, but it is certainly better than what we have with the Basel rules. I have argued also for years <clears throat> that the calculation of equity to total assets, the so-called leverage ratio, tells the banks, it tells the regulators, and it tells the public more about the strength of a bank than does the Basel rule. I would be quite willing to discuss what is an acceptable level of, of, uh, for leverage ratio, but that's a different than saying it is the more useful because it tells you how much loss absorbing capacity you have before a bank hits, number one, a liquidity crisis, and number two, insolvency. For example, U.S. GSIPs, the global systemic banks, rely on equity to fund only 7%, not 14%, 7% of assets on average, of their assets on average. Regional banks, over 100 billion, have ratios that are closer to 9%, and smaller regionals have about two, seven, nine and a half percent, and community banks have well over 10 percent. The most systemically important banks, in other words, are far more leveraged and less well capitalized than all the other groups. And I think we need to remember that uh, since they are the systemically important banks in the economy. The regulators know this, <clears throat> but they insist they know best about risk than the market does. And I beg to differ. Uh, results matter. The leverage ratio, while not perfect, is simpler, is more likely to be enforced, not just by regulators, but by investors and the public. When you see the amount of capital absorbing capacity shrink, you react if you're regulator, you react if you're the market, and you react if you're the public, and it keeps a greater degree of discipline in place. Now, the two big to fail banks, I understand they spend billions of dollars on lobbying. That's their right. They spend billions of dollars on advertising. That's perfectly okay. They pay billions of dollars in fines. That's the cost of doing business, according to some. But they insist that putting more of their own funds at risk is unaffordable. I think that's a little bit of a logical inconsistency. The two big to fail banks also say that stronger capital makes them weaker competitors with foreign banks. Maybe if they were racing the bottom, but not in terms of performance level. Let me give you an example. As of year in 2022, European, Canadian, and Asian GSIBs were required to invest, have their investor put in as much as 4 or 5% of their own money 
as a relationship or as a ratio to their total assets. The U.S. banks, as I said, have 7%, still marginally capitalized, but better than they were. In contrast, then, the U.S. GSIPs price-to-book ratios at the time that I gave you these ratios at the end of 2022 was above one to one, while the European banks were half of that and the Asian banks even less. And on a tangible book basis, the disparity was even greater. So I think my point is that I think investors prefer stronger to weaker balance sheets and stronger than weaker companies as proven by these kinds of ratios. The U.S. banks, even as they're marginally capitalized, relative to the others, represent a stronger force, stronger competitive force in a global marketplace, not a weaker. Finally, I want to say something about the FDIC's insistence on having long-term subordinated debt as part of capital. Because there is too little equity in the banks, the regulators are suggesting that banks hold more long-term debt, and in doing so, they reduce the losses the FDIC would absorb should a bank fail. That assumes that the choice is more debt or nothing, rather than more debt or more equity. And Mike, I go with more equity. While such a proposal would reduce the losses to the FDIC in a bank failure, it does not enhance the re resiliency of the bank itself or the financial stability of the industry it has less equity. Long-term debt on the balance sheet must be serviced from earnings, even when earnings are under pressure in a recession. Failures to service the debt places the organization in default and likely failure and accelerates panic. It doesn't decrease panic and it has systemic consequences. Thus, by increasing the debt, the institution must hold, the proposal actually weakens the resiliency of the bank and the industry, and they should stop it going that direction now. Most GSIBs, for example, carry long-term debt that is approximately 6 to 9% of assets, depending on how you calculate it. If GSIBs were required to fund themselves with an equivalent amount of equity in place of this debt, the institution would be less prone to failure in the first place, and should it fail, the losses to the FDIC would be no greater than if they were uh, than if they would have been uh, held if they had held long-term debt in its place. So equity serves a much greater um, stability purpose than does long-term debt. Also, I want to note the FDIC in the past has been a uh, understandably one of the most critical opponents to the use of long-term debt in the form at that time in the last crisis of trust preferred securities within the banking industry and its capital structure. In an article it published in 2010, following the great financial crisis, the FDIC emphasized that these so-called trusts or long-term debt were nothing but long-term debt and were a major source of instability during the financial crisis. The FDIC emphasized the importance of equity capital in mitigating the moral hazard within the banking industry by ensuring that the owners, the owners who reap the rewards when a bank's risk-taking is successful, also have a meaningful stake at risk should it fail. It emphasized that the effect of accumulated interest on debt actually makes raising capital when you need it most difficult. Therefore, it's counterproductive in the most crucial times. So I want to emphasize, number one, a simpler measure of leverage, racial equity to assets. It's extremely important that we turn that. We're not going to eliminate too big to fail, but we can mitigate it by reducing the likelihood of failure with more equity. Capital enhancement is the way to do it. Leverage ratio must be better and uh, are much better to use than risk-weighted assets by far. And I think as we learn, as we learn and go forward, we need to have, uh, if anything, we need to remember equity is the best solution to a problem that otherwise seems unsolvable or too big to fail. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. We'll turn now to Jerry. Thanks, Louise. And first of all, I want to thank uh, Dennis Kelleher and uh, Better Markets for putting on this excellent conference and also for fighting the good fight. 
to uh, try to make uh, our financial system better, more uh, egalitarian and safer. Um, so how to end too big to fail. Some discussion this morning suggested that perhaps this is not possible. Uh, Bill Cohen emphasized uh, that our financial system is inherently fragile and that we don't have any real alternative uh, to our banking and financial system, but we may just have to uh, live with it. Um, I do agree that the financial systems are fragile, but I think we can and we must do a lot better than that. First of all, as I tell my students, um, even if you have to sometimes bail out the banks, uh, you don't have to bail out the bankers. Um, now, uh, Bill and Jennifer and others have talked about accountability, how we can bring more accountability. Senator uh, Warren talked about clawbacks um, and how we can, uh, she has a bill now to, bring, to increase clawbacks from banks that were excessive, took on excessive risk um, and so forth. We also have to remember that uh, when General Motors uh, was on the verge of bankruptcy and around the time of the great financial crisis, the government um, removed the management and insisted on new management in those banks. So uh, we do not have to uh, bail out the, the, the bankers, even if sometimes we have to rescue uh, the banks. Now, um, we do have pol policy tools to make uh, th this kind of fragility uh, less 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 important, and uh, Tom and, and I know we're not are going to talk about uh, capital and equity and leverage requirements. This is uh, crucial. Uh, there are other important ideas. Arthur Wilmar didn't talk about it today, but he's proposed a new Glass-Steagall Act uh, to separate in investment and commercial banking. Um, there are many other important uh, ideas out there. And we need to we need to implement uh, some of them, uh, but in the end, with the fragile banking system, we will have to undertake some rescues. And so I am kind of asking a somewhat different question than we've asked so far: What are we, the taxpayer payers and the society, getting um, in uh, compensation for all the rescues we're we're undertaking? What are we getting back from that? Um, what kind of financial system, what kind of banks are, are we getting from that? How are they allocating credit? What are they doing? And what are they, are they really um, furthering the social, uh, the social ends that we need furthered in our economy? Are they helping us to solve the major problems that we face? Now, um, these are questions, for example, that were asked by the reformers in the New Deal. Uh, they wanted to make sure that um, not only were they going to restructure the financial system, but that the financial system would allocate credit uh, more productively and more equit equitably. Uh, they had restrictions, portfolio restrictions um, against certain kinds of speculations. They had a mission guided approach uh, to different segments of the financial sector, to, uh, ha have different missions, um, housing, commercial lending, et cetera. Um, and uh, the idea was, what are you going to be doing for us? Uh, we seem to have lost sight of that a bit. Um, uh, there's this um, lemon socialism or crony capitalism that we seem uh, to have created. So, for example, an important goal that needs to be, um, or important problem that, needs, that we need help with from the banks is climate change. We know that climate change is an existential threat. Uh, we know that it leads to fires, floods, droughts. We see that uh, everywhere. Um, there have been at least $24 billion disaster events this year so far, and there's going to be more. Um, and this is related to too big to fail. Uh, these kinds of, of uh, disasters are going to get worse, and they're going to create more financial instability. So they're going to create a, a need for even more bailouts, even more rescues in the future, uh, not only of our economy, but of our financial system as well. Is our financial system uh, doing what it needs to do to help fight this kind of catastrophic climate change? And the answer is no. Um, our major banks are among uh, the world's uh, largest 
investors and lenders into fossil fuel, the major cause of uh, uh, climate change. Um, they should be funding instead uh, green energy and alternative energy. Uh, we have many tools that we could use to, to get our, the banks uh, to do this, uh, uh, the ones that we're supporting, uh, the ones that we're bailing out, portfolio limits, asset-backed reserve requirements, uh, differential capital requirements, and so forth, uh, to have them lend more for uh, alternative energy. Um, but we also need to do more to limit our dependence on these banks. Bill Cohen said, what's the choice? We need these banks. We don't have any alternative to them. Well, I think that's not entirely true. Uh, so Sal Omarova uh, started talking about this in response to a question earlier. Um, we need more, what I call uh, banks without bankers. We need more public options in the financial sector to reduce our dependence on uh, the private banking system. So, for example, um, a, a number of people have proposed Fed accounts, that is, accounts at the Federal Reserve System uh, that can hold our savings uh, and um, can facilitate our payments. Uh, some people have suggested that this be connected with postal savings uh, accounts, which we used to have, um, to help especially marginalized borrowers uh, who don't have other options. So, this is an example of a, a public option. Um, that uh, can make us less dependent on these major financial runs that we were talking about with Silicon Valley Bank and so forth. Um, what about public banking? There are many uh, attempts by groups around the country to have uh, public banks, city banks, state banks, and so forth, uh, to provide credit for important needs like housing, uh, infrastructure, and so forth. Um, a green development bank, this is something that we, one thing we do have now, uh, the inflation, uh, uh, the IRA included a small uh, uh, green development bank that uh, has seed money to, to build in, into a bigger one. Uh, we need public banks of this kind uh, to serve uh, some of these needs that the private banking system is uh, not serving. Uh, another example is public asset managers, which uh, my colleague Lenore Palladino has proposed. So what stands in the way of getting these public options um, and of bringing the uh, too big to fail banks uh, uh, under more control. Well, of course, we've already talked about it to some extent, the wealth and income that these banks use to lobby politicians, um, but it's not just the banks. They have what I call a whole, a banker's club of, of some lawyers, economists, that's my profession, um, uh, and, and others who support their activities, who, uh, defend them, create an ideological context for them to thrive. And um, an important tool that the banks use uh, to, to solidify this group of the Bankers Club is offering them not only money, but jobs. We have the revolving door uh, in and out of, uh, of Congress, uh, re regulatory agencies, and so forth. Um, Jennifer Taub referred to this as capture, and this is very powerful in terms of solidifying the power of the Bankers Club. So not only do we have to think about what the, the banks are doing in terms of their credit allocation, we have to uh, try to end, uh, at least control, this kind of uh, corruption, the revolving door and the capture, uh, if we're going to have uh, much of a chance of, of um, reforming our financial system. Thankfully, we have club busters, uh, people who are fighting against the power of the Bankers Club. Uh, better Markets uh, is one of the most important. We have others, uh, such as the Americans for Financial Reform and many others uh, of, of people around uh, at this conference today who are all uh, club busters. So uh, my hat goes off to the club busters and uh, to Better Markets, and we just have to keep fighting uh, as much as possible the, the good fight. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks, Jerry. We'll turn now to Anat. Thank you. I really appreciate uh, Better Marks, and I very much appreciate uh, being allowed to speak uh, last. Um, I've had the experience of, of speaking first and then steaming throughout and not getting to respond to what was said. 
So, uh, so now I get to thank the people who uh, took the words out of my mouth and I get to uh, go after uh, some people who uh, I think were uh, not, not helpful necessarily in, in this. So I saw by saying the crisis uh, was wasted, but I want to say it was wasted uh, because um, not uh, in that they didn't know how to, uh, you know, they led to all these political crises, which they did, but that was somehow because the bailout was not enough and now they bailed out better, uh, but because they didn't uh, really engage in why it happened and in really how to fix it. And, um, and they could have, but they just wouldn't. Uh, I mean, a little bit here and there, little tweaks, but, you know, certainly we started the day after the brilliant uh, uh, talks, after Elizabeth Warren talk, talked about accountability and after Martin Wolf talked about the breakdown of democracy uh, post-financial crisis with hearing the usual narratives about how we don't have any choice and about all the runs that happen and the liquidity and panics. That's not what this was about. Uh, why did we have the panic, whether it's a social media panic or people standing out, out uh, online to get their money out because the bank is insolvent. That was true for uh, Washington Mutual and it was true for SBB and then it was true for First Republic. And what was true now is that very similar to the savings and loans, we have bailouts happening right now. And the Federal Reserve uh, is stepping in and the use of the word bailout is uh, now not popular. So you kind of say, oh, it's not taxpayer. It's just some other people someplace. Well, it's not the original people who took the risk that are bearing the risk. And that's what matters. Um, so that's that's uh, that's a problem. We also heard about Goldman Sachs and how brilliant they are in feel for their return on equity. Uh, but uh, but Simon Johnson took, took on some of that. Uh, talk, and I uh, it was immediately reminded me of uh, the story that um, Louis Story um, wrote after the financial crisis, which was entitled, I'll get a, get this uh, this quote right, um, it was entitled, uh, um, a federal program lends a, a helping hand to bank quietly, and um, here it is, and um, it started the following way, eager to escape the long arm of the government. Goldman Sachs was preparing to return $10 billion in taxpayer funds as fast as the ink can dry on the check. This is precise quote. But the bank and a number of others is quietly holding on to other forms of public support that come with virtually no strings attached. And this was a program by the FDIC, remember. Goldman Sachs doesn't even have deposits, but it became a bank holding company. And if it hates so much the regulation, maybe it could go back to being a partnership and that might be better. But uh, instead it took a program from the FDIC that allowed it to behave just like Fannie and Freddie and to go raise money in debt markets with a guarantee of the FDIC, quietly, except for Louise Story's story. Thank you for that, Louise. Um, so, uh, so we every so often get this glimpse of just how much the industry is coddled. So if you call that market free market capitalism, that's the wrong description. This is not capitalism. This is not market. If any word capitalism is attached to it, it's crony capitalism. There, um, this is not, this is not the market. And so crying over the fact that you don't actually have a business model, that's, that's, uh, that's a problem. Uh, if you cannot really fund your investment um, with equity. What does that say about your business model? You need so, so much subsidies. So um, we have a very reckless system and everything that's wrong with this system is due to too much debt and bad incentives and really bad regulations. And that's really a choice that we have, that we somehow got stuck in having these messy uh, regulations. Uh, so um, the central bank uh, is there supposedly to provide liquidity support, but it's not supposed to uh, bail out insolvent institutions, yet it's doing it right now. And it did it uh, during COVID as well. Um, so, um, and they've proposed us to have debt. Tom Honig uh, thankfully took care of that. That is really 
frustrating for those of us who have been arguing for equity and said what we get right now is a massive over thousand pages tweak of some risk weights. And that's all we're seeing. And that's what a lot of the battle is about. Jeremy Kress said, oh, they'll double the equity of something. Martin Wolf was brilliant as he wrote about Basel that uh, it was the uh, lion that didn't roar back in 2010, in which he said tripling almost nothing doesn't give you a large number. So when you say that there's more 16% more of virtually no equity uh, to speak of and very poorly measured, it's almost like you say, oh, the speed limit was lowered from 98 to 90. Four, and I'm not even measuring it correctly. So the First Republic Bank and, and SVB, they all had great capital ratios by these metrics. And throughout the crisis, all these problem banks look just perfectly fine if that's the radar you're looking at and there's no crisis. Market prices would have told you, but we know from research by Andy Heldine and others that these capital ratios meant absolutely nothing. All of a sudden, everybody's running because the market knows the bank is insolvent, especially if they're un, uh, uninsured. But of course, now everybody is insured. So is that a good life? Uh, no. So anyway, uh, the politics of banking is, uh, is what I discovered as I just stepped into this space from just my professor of corporate of finance, teaching corporate finance at Stanford Business School and asking myself, what just happened here? I thought we had a wonderful system. I was telling my students, finance is a wonderful thing. And now what is going on? And I was absolutely horrified at what I see, at what I saw, what I continue to see and what I heard and continue to hear, which is really a muddled uh, discussion that includes unfortunately, as Jerry said, uh, economists and banking economists. The book that was mentioned earlier by myself uh, and Martin Helwig is actually coming out uh, together with, uh, I understand, uh, two others on this uh, um, panel, Jerry's book, uh, which I am just now beginning to read, and uh, Louise's book, which I really look forward to. Um, uh, our book has 200 pages of new material explaining ever more of why the bailouts, how the bailouts happen and why the bailouts happen all the time, including, and we managed to scramble to include events through May 2023, including SVB, including Credit Suisse, which was our poster child for the current big zombie systemic bank. Now, I want to say one more thing about systemic institution. That word was thrown around a lot. We were debating but uh, whether it's, uh, it's about size or it's about something else. Well, contagion mechanisms, which we explain uh, very clearly in our book about dominoes, include that you learn from, that you get awakened to the weakness of other institutions. So it can be from very small bank. A systemic institution can be a hedge fund like uh, like LTCM was, um, but you know we meant to uh, regulate the whole system, and the whole system, shadow banks and others, goes back into itself. Uh, but instead, systemic became the excuse for bailouts. That's what actually happened. So right now, systemic exception is a buzzword you you need to use if you want to bail out anybody. All of a sudden. It's systemic. So it's a very sad situation that we're here today, uh, 15 years later, and it's more than 10 years after we published our book and it would come out in January, 2024. I don't have the book here as uh, Reid showed his. Uh, it shows some uh, naked uh, people with the ties covering uh, up some of them. And the, the ties were colored red for the new edition, uh, which uh, has a variation on the old one, and it basically tucked on 200 pages uh, of new text explaining about central banks and how they work, removing the mystery about that, and going all the way to democracy and the rule of law. So the end is, Martin Wolf said, corruption has become the system. Our last chapter is called Above the Law, question mark. And we go through the corporate settlements, and we go through a lot of scandals, London Way, and settlement of JP Morgan Chase, uh, robbery of taxes in Europe, Deutsche Bank, uh, 
Uh, we gave a pass to HSBC, which shouldn't have. Um, and it's about power and the rule of law and why, as we the title of our last uh, 200 pages is, this system undermines democracy and the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you to you all. Those were excellent presentations and we'll dive into questions. And just to the people watching, if you put your questions in, I'll be looking at them real time and we'll try to include some. And also I hope that the panelists will jump in along with me and ask their colleagues questions as well. One thing I just wanna ask, you know, the title of our panel is, what can we do to end too big to fail? Um, and a number of the panelists have talked about how the bailouts, you know, that it's bad that they primarily help one sector and they help the bankers and that we're not expecting enough, you know, for the public out of them, um, but not about how to get rid of too big to fail. And in fact, Tom, you talked about too big to fail as now being a fixture of the US financial system. And so I just wanted to ask if you all actually think we can get rid of too big to fail? Do you want to get rid of it? Maybe we'll start with Tom and maybe if you could just chime in on just stepping back, can we end too big to fail? Well, thank you. A, a good question. Um, I know I don't think we can end too big to fail because we have no no resolve to do so. Um, after the last crisis, you know, one of the, one of the proposals out, that I had at least and others was to simplify their structure um, make them more manageable. Uh, and uh, Art in the earlier panel said, you know, separate out the investment bank from, from the commercial bank again, because what you did by allowing the investment bank to come into the bank is extend the safety net. And when you did that, you opened up uh, a greater systemic risk problem. So th that was ignored. Uh, and what the, the solution was, was to increase the regulation dramatically. That's what Dodd-Frank is about, managing every aspect of it. Well, regulators can't do that. And we've proven that by the last, uh, more recent experiences. So that's not going to solve the too big to fail. And so I think we have it. And the and what Anand and I are saying is, and others before us, is that the one thing you can do is reduce the likelihood that you will have to bail them out. And that takes investors more at risk, more money at risk, a bigger portion of their funding coming from investors who, who know their risk, who do take the downside. And that would bring greater discipline and bring more of a market into the system rather than a, an administrative body like the Fed or the FDIC or the controller of the currency. We're now managing more and more of these activities. So I, I think it's, it's with us. I think the only thing we do is mitigate it because uh, we're not willing to take the really disruptive actions of uh, simplifying the structure and making the market more functioning. I want to come back to that capital point, Tom. I think it's an excellent point for you know, not to talk more about. But before we do, I just want to ask the rest of the panel, is there anyone who would make the case that we could and should um, end too big to fail? And how would we do that? I can chime in on something. And actually, I want to go away from capital and talk about structural uh, reform. In the book, and it was mentioned earlier uh, in an earlier panel, that we actually uh, argue that the system can become too big to save, that this amounts are serious, that uh, you know some nations in Europe were unable to bail out their banks. Uh, and could it happen in the US? Well, I mean, the numbers are large. Uh, let's just say, of the system as a whole. And if there's so many trillions and trillions of people expecting their money to be there, it could be cybersecurity, it could be something else, but we're in for, uh, for, for, for a lot. Now, one question we also raise is, Mervyn King once said, if a bank is too big to fail, it's too big. Now, what does that mean? Tom Honig has written from 2010 to Too Big to Succeed, and Simon Johnson has told, talked about and others about breaking up or Glass-Steagall and all of that. One question I want to ask here about this structural issue is, do we need global banks? Does a bank need to live in multiple national jurisdictions? The fact of the matter is, 
that in the resolution authority, and I was uh, Simon Johnson and Tom, Tom Honig knows uh, we were there together in the Systemic Resolution Advisory Committee of the FDIC, where there was a lot of talk on what's called as a single point of entry and all these things for global banks. One country will, will handle all of it, the home country, the headquarters country. Well, that's just not going to happen because no country is going to allow. We saw this even in SVB. No country is going to allow another country to, uh, to, to control things if they can protect their citizens. So that's just not going to happen. So we cannot resolve it. Now, this goes back, the global banking go in the U.S. anyway, goes back to a 1919 law called the EDGE Act. And, you know, it's long forgotten, although uh, Graham Steele currently at Treasury wrote about the EDGE Act, living on the edge. And we have to question whether the same corporation should have systemic footprints in multiple jurisdictions because they can move the money around across jurisdictions, but then nobody can really control them or let them fail. That is a formula for recklessness and lawlessness that we see in banking. The other thing that we didn't touch after the financial crisis, and I also meant to say that, but it does need legislation, is to change the tax code, which is a complete shoot yourself in the foot uh, encouragement for debt over equity in the tax code, which is a first order effect that I studied in my corporate finance research published in top finance journals in 2018 that creates an addiction to debt once you have a lot of it. It's addictive. And the tax effect is first order there of why every highly indebted company would resist reducing leverage and would always increase it, especially when it's high, if they can get away with it. And of course, the banks can get away with it more than anybody because they have passive creditors, debt depositors, and they have guarantees. And so they just become addicted so that zero is the, the capital they'll choose, zero. And the market might let them. We explain all of the dynamics of bailouts and what their effects are in the book. But anyway, the fact that the debt that the tax code in many jurisdictions, in most jurisdictions, encourages debt over equity for corporations and even for homeowners, which some countries have taken care of. You can subsidize what you want, but you don't need to do it through subsidizing private debt. We have that even in student loans and other heavy private indebtedness that plagues the economy. Bankruptcy code as well adds fragility with safe harbor to derivatives and repose and other things that somehow never got fixed. Go ahead, Jerry or Reed, if you want to chime in. Yes. Um, so I think we have to distinguish between uh, whether we have the technical and policy tools to end too big to fail, um, and the political uh, the political will to do it. And um, I think uh, many people who spoke today and, and, and others uh, know what technically what needs to be done. Um, and so I think people are also making assessments of politically whether it's possible, and it appears so far that it's not. However, Martin Wolf this morning said, look, the political bailouts of these banks, time after time after time, is not sustainable. It is not politically sustainable. That is, um, it generates anger, it generates a feeling of people being left out. You know, we bailed up uh, Wall Street, but we didn't bail out Main Street. That was a common cry after the crisis. So, we don't really have uh, that much choice. That is, we have to figure out a way to really rein in uh, too big to fail or we're going to lose, I agree with Martin Wolf, or we're going to lose our democracy. So it really is incumbent um, uh, upon uh, us to figure out what is giving the, this political perspective that is, that is uh, making it so difficult to reform the system, what's giving them so much power? And a, and a lot of it has to do with money. It has to do with the revolving door, with the campaign contributions, with the underlying way in, uh, in which uh, the, the banking system is able to pay, uh, buy our political system. And so we have to think about these kinds of reforms as being absolutely essential uh, to ending too big to fail and uh, saving our democracy. You know, Jerry, one of the things that's so interesting that I remember from 2008 is that many of the actions that were taken were justified that they should be done by arguing that the whole public needed them. 
But as many of you all, all have highlighted, in fact, they didn't benefit the whole public. And I'll never forget in the fall of 2008, the number of bank executives and lobbyists and people in Washington uh, who you know worked for different congressional leaders and congressional leaders themselves who told me on the phone, if we don't do this, the ATMs will not give people money. So how are people going to get their money? And so the justification was it was needed by the masses, but that wasn't the result. And I think it'd be great for Reed to address this in his book. Um, he very eloquently talks about how can you do the most for the most? How can you not just benefit one sector? How can you do the most for the most? And Reed, it, it'd be really interesting to hear how if there are bailouts, how could you see them being done differently um, to benefit more people? So Lu Louise, everybody, you know, the three rules of family life, find fault, assign blame, and mete out punishment. So that's the way everybody behaves in their in their normal life. And that was what was missing at the time, right? Uh, now, why was that missing? Uh, it, was, it was very seriously discussed, Louise. You know this from writing about it in the moment. And uh, it was Geithner in particular who took the following view. We're trying to get all these executives to get the system working again. We cannot be threatening them with punishment at the exact same time. They have to be fully rewarded, fully incentivized to get the system working again. And this is this is not a moment where, where um, anyone should be held to account. <clears throat> that is, and this is what I think Jerry just said, that, that, that politically is not a sustainable uh, a way to approach the situation. It wasn't, it didn't work for Obama. And I think we all agree that however torturous the line between the election of 2008 and the election of 2016, there is a line that, that, that traces over that time period. So it does seem to me that a, an appropriate legal paradigm or cultural uh, rule would be one in which, you know, uh, where there is a fault found, uh, there's, there's somebody to, to, um, you know, to, to be to be held responsible. Uh, every corporation that I've been involved in, been on the board of, or in any way been involved with as an advisor, any role at all, there's always been a culture where where certain conduct do doesn't get you rewarded. That's what really stands out about the financial uh, bailout of 2008 and nine, which is the bailout was was filled with rewards for the bailed out. Um, only the layman folks was it was it not really true, right? Um, so that that's thing number one. But then thing number two, just speaking about the world of practicality, you know, there are certain systems in our economy that simply have to be maintained. Uh, and to round this off to really big truths, uh, if we had if we were China, you don't have to worry about bailing out the financial structure. They control the, the government controls the financial structure. It's part of the communist uh, apparatus. And what we've seen in the last couple of years is that uh, the, 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 the communist party believes the same thing applies to their relationship to the technology industry as well, right? It's a controlled system. But in our system, you know, we count on fractional banking to create credit, to create money, to decide who gets to run businesses and who doesn't. We count on private companies to run the communications uh, system. Seven out of eight uh, watts in the energy economy are created and distributed by private companies. This is not a nationalized system, right? This is a privatized system. And so you, we cannot, with our system, have energy or communications or finance simply disappear. So if that's what we mean by bailout, there'll always be bailouts. These, 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 these systems will always have to be maintained. I think that's not quite what we mean. I think what we really mean is accountability. Great points. And I think, you know, um, read a number of things that you were just bringing up um, are related to points Jerry has made about public banks and about credit allocation. And, um, you know, one of the things in the work I've been doing around the black white wealth gap for this book I have coming out where we do cover the effects of the financial crisis on different racial groups in our book um, is, you know, a look at how um, private banks, you know, have not always equitably treated credit. So Jerry, I wonder if you could just explain for us a little bit more about you talked about the federal savings accounts and the postal service bank, but how would a public bank handle 
credit allocation and, you know, keeping in mind that in the past federal government efforts like the New Deal, you know, were not always equitable in how they allocated government benefits. So how, how would you address that now in an equitable way? Well, that's a great question. Um, and uh, uh, I'd also be interested to hear what, what you have to say about this, since I'm sure you've been thinking about this as well. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, what, what gives me hope is that a lot of the the activists, the groups that are trying, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> trying to create public banks are motivated uh, by, among other things, to try to uh, help close the uh, racial wealth gap and to try to make sure that there's investment in, in job creation and in housing and in other uh, needed activities in neighborhoods where, where these have, have been redlined out or historically uh, uh, have not happened. So, um, so the motivation and the groups of, of people that are pushing for these things, I think, is um, is one of the uh, the uh, things that gives me some kind of hope. But the problem with these uh, public bank initiatives uh, is that uh, it's really hard to get off the ground. And um, the way I think about it is that if we think about the kind of bailouts the Federal Reserve has given to the mega banks, but they've given absolutely uh, no support, no creation, no no in creation of infrastructure for for these kinds of initiatives. It's really not a level playing field. Now, um, some Congress people put in legislation uh, to uh, create an infrastructure for public banks, like the ones I've just described, to give them access to the Federal Reserve discount window, um, to uh, make it possible for them uh, to to raise capital and 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 a like other banks can raise capital and so forth. So um, if, if we're gonna bring this kind of initiative to scale, it needs some of the same kind of infrastructure for these kinds of institutions that the Federal Reserve has been giving to our mega banks for a long time. Can I mention something about public banks, Louise? Uh, yeah. So uh, not, I don't wanna hog too much of your time, but in December of 2008, I, uh, met with Larry Summers and said, well, as long as you're going to save all these banks, could you create a public bank called a National Green Bank? And he said, no, no, we banks are problems. The, you know, we don't want to add another problem. So then I just ignored him and went up to uh, Congress and met with then Congressman Chris Van Hollen and said the same thing. And he said, I think that's a great idea. I'm going to call it a Green Bank. And I said, well, you know, green and bank are like the two worst word, words in politics. And he said, yeah, but people will get used to it. And he wrote something called the Green Bank Act of 2009, which was a public bank, public capital to co-invest in driving the energy transition from carbon to clean. From 2009 until August of last year, uh, that bill was introduced again and again. He became a senator. The uh, the co-author, uh, Ed Markey, became a senator. And it is in the Inflation Reduction Act. It only took 14 years. Uh, and 28 days from today, um, our nonprofit will ask EPA for $10 billion of capital to get the first public environmentally focused uh, bank in the United States created. Can I? Yes, yes, please do. I, I, I know we're off on this public bank, but I do want to caution you. Um, public banks have still individual CEOs and others who are involved in this, and they 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 bite at the same bait. Low interest rates, we're going to get loans out, we're going to get volume. And if you think about it, that if you want to go that way, that's fine, but there it's not going to end the consequences of too big to fail. For example, Fannie and Freddie, um, you can say what you want. I think they were public banks long before they were nationalized. Uh, the uh, Small Business Administration, the farm credit system, which was bailed out in the crisis of the 70s uh, as well. The, the, the uh, student loan program, public program. So, I mean, that's not going to stop crises. The crisis is, back to your point, accountability. Also, what you're seeing with this consolidation and, these, and this heavy regulation that goes on is community banks, which have been community and smaller regionals, have been mainstays for small business lending and for new ideas and for uh, serving the, the community well. 
uh, including for minorities. Minority banks have a wonderful history back to the 19th century. Um, so, you know, let's, let's focus on too big to fail and making them function properly rather than creating more institutions that are too big to fail because Fannie and Freddie are too big to fail. The SBA is never going to fail. Credit farm credit system has been bailed out twice. The Federal Home Loan Bank system has been bailed out once and now has recommissioned itself. So let's focus on how do we deal too big to fail and how do we get the market back in the game rather than uh, crony capitalism. Uh, I, I object to that every bit as much as anyone else does, but get the market back in the game to allocate credit uh, in the best way across communities as well as uh, national firms. A great points, Tom. And actually, um, you could argue that the existing big, too big to fail banks are kind of public banks. They aren't. There aren't strong expectations that they do public good. And you know, Jerry, you talked about maybe there should be more expectations on them. But since they're too big to fail, um, you know, there is that. I, I'm wondering. I love um, the inside story that Reed gave us about the conversation with Larry Summers. And Tom, you've been at a lot of inside tables at regulate with regulators, the Federal Reserve and the FDIC. And I wonder if you could share with us on a couple topics, any inside skinny on people who are blocking progress as you see it, in particular around um, requiring more equity capital. That's something you and Anat both would like to see more of. Who is blocking that? Give us the details. And then also an area of interest to the audience, based on audience questions is, why not just bring back Glass-Steagall? And so I wonder, Tom, if you could just share with us anything about who, um, who's who been the main opponents um, to both equity capital and um, Glass-Steagall, and we would love names. Well, first of all, the industry is, of course, but inside, you know, one of the things I think about, for, for example, capital, I think there's a certain, I don't know what the right word is, I'm going to use the word arrogance within these bureaucracies like the Fed, the FDIC, where um, the technicians, uh, the economists, the financial people who think they can model everything on earth. I mean, they can model your day for you and tell you exactly what you're going to do five years from now. They, they control the agenda. And uh, I remember in the early days of, of the issues around risk-weighted capital, Oh, no, no. Here, we have the model here. This is how we're going to do it. And that's how we're going to allocate the risk on your assets. And you'd say, well, wait a minute. Risk changes by the minute. How, how, how are you going to do Oh, no, we have notice of proposal. We have this. But we have the right model. So I think there's a certain arrogance that keeps them tied to risk-weighted capital globally. Plus, the industry doesn't object to that. You know why? They can game it. They can game it in an instant. In fact, I was in a, I was in a meeting in Europe with the European bank, he said, just give me what the rule is so I can, I can figure out how to, how to get around it. That's all he cared about. And so that's number one. Uh, the, the, the incentives are such that uh, I'm, I, have, I have a whole infrastructure around building um, risk-weighted capital models. And I hate, to say the, I hate to see the layoff numbers if you abandon that. So that's, that's part of it. On Glass-Steagall, again, there's a I, I was not inside the Obama administration. I was a Fed. But when I brought it up, it was, uh, you, you can't do it. The government, you know, the government's too dependent on these large banks for uh, primary dealers. They help issue the debt. They have to be big. They have to have scale. Uh, and so I think there's this, inside the government, this resistance to saying, well, wait a minute, maybe we can do it. Uh, maybe we can simplify the systems more. Um, it doesn't serve their it doesn't serve their agenda. And it certainly doesn't serve the too big to fail banks agenda. And and when you're in those debates, uh, if you're the if you're uh, in the minority, you are definitely in the minority. You are uh, listened to politely and then ignored. Uh, so that, that that that's something you just can't get around. Thank you, Anat. I wonder um, if you could expand on both you and Tom have talked about the need for more equity capital, and of course. A lot of people this year um, have been watching closely what's happened with the regional banks and SVB. And I wonder if you could expand how having higher equity capital rules uh, might have changed what occurred there. Well, the issue is partly 
how you measure it. So you got to start with that. I mean, the case of SVB uh, and, and continuing to today, if the banks uh, have assets whose values goes down, but they claim that they hold it to maturity, like a bond, then you, we don't recognize the losses, even now. But it, they matter, because even if you say you can hold something to maturity, uh, you may not be able to, because the depositors are asking for higher interest and your assets are not worth as much. So you become insolvent, so you have to sell or go under. So obviously, had SVB had 20% equity, like we recommend between 20 and 30, which was before we even had such a complicated system, was common in banking, uh, even 50% back when there were partnerships with unlimited liability. Um, somehow these numbers are crazy. And yes, they ignore you so much that right now, as we speak, the banks are lobbying against a little increase, they claim, in these Basel rules. And, um, and the Fed is not citing good academic research for why this is not costly for society at all. It's a, the biggest bargain. You can have the cake and eat it too. You don't have to give up anything. In fact, as Tom noted and others, um, it's the risk weights that are distorting. It's the government and the banks that are in symbiotic relationship. It's the government that always wants to give itself a low risk weight so that the bank always holds its bonds. So it doesn't lend to businesses uh, who, who need it where we need the banks the most. Instead, it just became this crazy game in which Nobody can fail. The system itself is incredibly bloated. And we just seem to accept that there's no political will to change it. It's just, again, very sad. We finished our book back in 2012 when we finished writing it, saying we can have a better system. What's missing is political will. And that was back then. Uh, certainly, we didn't find the political will since then. And, I, and we have become ever more concerned with what all of this means for democracy. So right now we're concerned with, with political discourse. We're concerned with the breakdown of democracy, like, uh, like Martin Wolf said. And we end the book this time by talking about being able to give more power to truth. And truth seems very elusive these days. We have, we're living a post-fact world in which we can't even agree on basic stuff. So we got a long way to climb to begin to diagnose what we need to do and actually do it. And I think Tom, can you jump in? Can, Go ahead, Tom. Can I ask one, uh, make one point? Uh, take for, I, this is a counterfactual, but take, for example, Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley grew uh, in one year by 60% and another year by another 30% it grew. If they had a leverage capital requirement, equity capital that they, they had to have investors fund of 15%, then the investors would have said, wait a minute, this thing is growing. We need all that their capital calls would be enormous. And the investors would have said, wait a minute, I want to see what the risk is of this. And they probably would have grown much more slowly if, it was, if they had to re raise real equity, not debt. Uh, and we would have slowed that uh, hyper increase. Uh, I think that's something we shouldn't we shouldn't forget as we go forward from here. And you're right, Anat, because you are allowing them to, to uh, keep losses off the book on holding maturity, it says, well, we'll just keep going the way we have uh, and not bring more equity in early on. And when you need it, as they did try, they tried, Silicon Valley tried to issue debt, that made the crisis worse. So the timing was terrible. So you have to have it set in advance and it has to be firm and strict that helps control the uh, unwieldy growth and gives more stability to the system. You, yeah, you, it doesn't end too big to fail in that sense, but it brings more discipline to the system and more accountability because if you want to, if you want to be accountable, you get, you get your investors angry at you. If they have enough at stake, they're the ones going to be suing these guys for accountability and civil lawsuits and everything else. Management will come under a lot more pressure. As, um, Jerry, go ahead, and then we'll go ahead. Can I just add some, a little something to this? But <clears throat> the problem is, some people mentioned earlier, um, in terms of these kinds of rules and how to enforce them, uh, supervision is crucial. And uh, what, what happened at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco um, really reminds me of what happened with uh, 
Carmen Segarra, I don't know, if, Louise, if you followed that story, uh, mm -hmm. and the New York Fed, um, where in response to the, the, this report by Columbia professor Beam, um, so we need to think outside the box. We have to put people supervising in these banks who will stand up for them and uh, call out if there's a problem. Uh, so, you know, she tried to do that and she was fired. Um, and partly it's because of this cultural cap, uh, capture, but a lot of it, again, is the revolving door that a lot of other supervisors sitting around that desk uh, were hoping that they were gonna get a job with, with Goldman Sachs when all this was over. So in, in order to enforce any kinds of these regulations, yes, there might be some private enforcement and so forth. We really have to do something about the revolving door and about uh, the capture. Um, we can't avoid that. And Jerry, just real quick on that, before I go to kind of a wrap up question, it, that is something the audience has asked about. They've asked, how would we get rid of the revolving door? I mean, do you have a plan to get rid of it or does anyone? Well, I, um, I think it could just be a regulatory decision. The Federal Reserve can set up its own rules and say, we're not gonna allow this kind of um, employment behavior again. They already have some rules. You know, that you have to have a year, you have to wait a year before you have certain kinds of get certain kinds of jobs and so forth. I think they have to make it longer and, and clearer. Um, I think each, each of these regulatory agencies, Tom could speak to this, whether I'm, I'm, this is correct or not, um, could, can establish their, pretty much their own rules about this. I, I, I would caution you on one thing. I agree, there's, there's cooling off periods afterwards, and that's fine. However, most of the highest levels in these regulatory agencies come from industry. They're not going to industry, they come. So you'd have to say, you'd have to block them from coming to the industry. And then they're going to argue, but they, they're the most knowledgeable. They're the ones, the people that know best and so forth. So it's, it's a very legitimate point. I, I understand the revolving door. So what you have to do is you have to make the, the regulatory industry its own industry. And that's good luck on that one too, because <laughs> I came up inside the Fed. I know what was there. Uh, I didn't come from outside the industry, but I'm an exception. I'm an exception. Well, can I just add a couple? Th so, you know, you probably know that Paul Volcker and um, I think it was Sheila Baird tried to create this initiative to train reg financial regulators. I don't yeah. know if that's still going on, but um, it doesn't really make it an industry, but it, 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 it creates uh, 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 experts in the public interest. But remember but who that- picks? Who picks? Congress picks, the Senate picks, the president picks, and they always pick who? Someone they know, someone from the industry, someone that someone says is good. Yeah, well, we know that there are many people who, at this conference who uh, were put up and, and weren't chosen. So Salam Omarava was blocked. And she knows as much as anybody. She had what jobs in the point? industry too. And so there was an ideological test uh, that, that she had to uh, go over. And it, it wasn't lack of expertise. It wasn't because she uh, wasn't from the industry. Um, so uh, yes, it's a political struggle. There's no clear uh, mechanized, mechanistic rule that, that can solve this problem, but we can try. And of course, you know, it's very difficult to get inside people's heads and know their intentions and in taking any job. But, you know, if someone's from industry, they could do a phenomenal job in the public interest, or if they're not, you have examples on all different biographies doing great and disappointing work in government. But I think the key may be just coming back to the point of who are you serving? Are you serving the public? Are you serving one sector? And, you know, keeping that at the forefront. Um, as we're wrapping up, I'd love to ask you all one more question. I hope you can all um, address, you know, since 2008, it's been 15 years and, you know, I covered it in real time. And then frankly, you know, until a couple of years ago, I hadn't been as focused on it. I was doing other things. And as I've been doing this book on the black white wealth gap, I've realized that, in fact, there's new aspects of the financial crisis I didn't focus on as heavily. And I can see with the distance of 15 years that the financial crisis and the responses to it had very big um, differences in effects by, for people by race. And so that's been a new thing that I've probed and come to understand better only recently. And um, I would love to hear from each of you. You all knew a lot about what to do and what you thought back in 08, 09, 10, and 11. But what do you know now in 2023 with 15 years of distance that you didn't know then? 
Maybe a knot. Do you want to go first? <laughs> I didn't know what maybe other people here knew, even though I'm pretty interested in politics in general and I follow, I did not realize uh, the politics of banking being so so entrenched, so difficult, so intractable. I didn't know at the time, I didn't understand about central banks, now I do. Um, so I learned a lot about this system and it's been a, I mean, it's been a traumatic experience, I have to say, personally, uh, just because of how intractable and political it is. Um, I, I can offer the following. Um, I've always had a great respect for human nature and what incense people. But in this, in the, and not just the last crisis, but in the, from the crisis of the 70s and 80s through the great financial crisis to now, I found that there is a pattern of interaction, of, should I say, interrelated um, policy mistakes. Uh, the, the crisis of the, the 70s that led to the 80s and the Volcker period was a period of very low interest rates and high fiscal spending that then became a, a bait and uh, incented the banks to lend on collateral, lend more freely because interest rates were low and you went forward from there until you had inflation. And then you had to raise interest rates and we have a crisis. And then we react to the crisis because that's all we can do. And then that was the 80s. And then we come to the great financial crisis. Interest rates went to, to 1%. People were using their homes as ATMs because they were incented to do that. It was cheap to borrow and spend. And we did it and we went forward from that. We had inflation, we raised interest rates, we had the great financial crisis and all these wonderful loans, all this ATM that was available to us suddenly crashed and we had a crisis and we had to bail it out. And so here we are again, we had a period where we had a terrible pandemic. No one has to explain to me why we spent the money, but then we kept spending it as, as we've said. And we now have inflation and we've raised rates to from almost nothing to five and a quarter, and now we have the risk of another crisis. So I, I think we ought to go back and look at our pattern of behavior and say, all right, where, how, how, do we, how do we get this interconnection understood better and monitored and controlled better so that we don't have this repeated uh, extreme cycles? Thanks, Tom. Jerry or Reed, anyone? I'll go, I guess. Um... I think at one level, I sort of knew this, but it's really come home to me how important public engagement is if we're going to solve this problem. Um, as long as it's uh, just a uh, inside ball game, um, it, the Washington game, uh, the banks are just too powerful. Um, but if we can really involve the, the, the public and, and be part of a group that helps to educate the public on these issues in any way that we can, and as explain and try to get them to see how important it is for democracy and other things they care about, like climate change, for example, um, we might have more of a fighting chance to, to make a difference. So I think that's why many of us uh, wrote books to try to reach out to the, to the public, but there are many other ways to engage. So that's, I think, become uh, more important to me as, as time has gone on. Uh Louise, uh, um, I'll, I'll tell you what I didn't know then that I know now, but I want to preface it by saying I can't understand why I didn't know it then. Mm -hmm. So what, what's the big truth about crises? Uh, they cast very long shadows. So, you know, I mean, everyone's read so many books about the Depression. Probably many of you have written books about them. I don't know. Uh, you know, um, uh, the, the 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 economists brought in you know to advise the Obama administration were experts about it. They were writing about how the what we generally describe as the crash of twenty nine you know then cast this uh, world shaping shadow where it defined uh, politics in America, created the opportunity for the New Deal coalition. Franklin Roosevelt put that together. That coalition uh, ruled American politics for roughly 40 or 50 years. Uh, 
that uh, crisis in Europe, of course, uh, you know, led to the rise of fascism. Then we have World War II, all from all from the financial crisis, right? Uh, now you could get into it more. You could talk about, you know, well, it wasn't only a financial crisis, but 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 it was a but it was a moment that that cast a a, a world circling in an incredibly dark uh, uh, shadow. Uh, you know, other other crises, you know, c come to mind. But then in 2008 and nine, what I remember very vividly is that everybody involved thought that what was happening could not conceivably have been happening. It was it had been ruled out. The the system that was put in place in response to 1929 now was working so wonderfully well that it was impossible to have a financial crisis. And yet there it was right in front of everybody. And so right in the transition team, and I remember this extremely well, you know, there was hardly anyone who even knew what fractional banking was. And you couldn't find two people on the uh, uh, decision-making floor who knew what a credit default swap was. And I remember Geithner saying, I don't have any staff. And I said, well, why don't I get you somebody? And so I went to a friend of mine at Blackstone and I persuaded him to uh, quit right away and become Geithner's staff guy. He stayed for the next three years. No one had any idea, any real deep idea about how serious the, the problem was. But especially because you asked, what did I learn? I don't think any of us understood that that crisis would define politics for at least the next decade. And what, and, and to turn this over to Matt in one second, and then the only thing that, that changed that is the COVID crisis, which, which preempted, so to speak, as a causal fact. And that COVID crisis and its response will at least run for the next decade or at least until the next crisis. So it's the long durée, right, that I didn't, uh, didn't, that wasn't, couldn't predict at the time, didn't think about, none of us thought about. I mean, to conclude, you know, Geithner's view was, as soon as I get these uh, banks back, everything will be restored to normal, just like that. And his brilliant stress test idea, which was truly brilliant, accomplished exactly that, except for the part about everything going back to normal didn't happen. <laughs> Thanks for you to not. Do you have another thought? Yes, I have one final thought, which is, you know, we talked about accountability and we talked about accountability for bankers, but my problem is really that we don't have accountability for the policymakers, for the regulators, for the Geithners, for the Bernankes of this world. Because Ben Bernanke was a hero for saving and he wrote a book called The Courage to Act, but he didn't have the courage to stop a dividend. He didn't have the courage to engage on the issues himself. And he's somebody who was my colleague, so he knows very well and he could have engaged, but he wouldn't. So uh, then he revolved. Now revolvers do great. Gary Gensler is a revolver. He's awesome. So it's not a question of where you came from. It's a question of whether you remember what you're supposed to be doing. And, um, and, and that's where it's very tricky to know, to put a formula on these revolving doors and all of that. But one thing that's a problem in our political system is just that we've gotten a government and people in it uh, who, um, who are not paid well, who feel they uh, who are moving on to the private sector and we got an attitude problem towards the government. We're saying the government is corrupt and the government is the problem that goes back to Ro Ronald Reagan uh, instead of owning the fact that the government needs to work for us. And uh, we uh, we definitely need to go to the public. That's the reason I wrote my book. Um, and uh, I hope the public gets to understand what the problems are and demand that they are solved. Thank you. I think these are all really helpful points. And when all of you were just giving these remarks and Reed was uh, pointing to the depression too, I think um, the other really interesting the thing about this is we don't really know when the financial crisis period is over. You know, how will historians view this in a, in a hundred years with what's gone on with regional banks this year and the fact that too big to fail is still here? Perhaps we're still in the midst of something larger that will only be stood, you know, understood in a much longer time period. Um, but thank you so much to the panelists for helping us look at it 15 years later into the lineup today. And now I will turn it over to Dennis Kelleher for closing remarks.